So three years ago, we began research work on the technical history of closed captioning. It was clear that there was a need for a flexible, open, and accessible me means of working with raw caption data from vintage sources. Existing solutions are generally designed for caption authoring, which generally don't necessarily support all of the features or the multiplex bit streams that were in use when these systems were first deployed. These failings are only further compounded by problematic support for imperfect source materials, which are anything except rare in the analog domain. So lacking other options, we developed our own solution, which represents a distinctly different approach to the matter. This approach was shaped by four design goals. First, that the full range of transmitted data should be extractable and preservable. Second, that extractable, extracted data should be editable on a low level. Third, that in keeping with the Unix philosophy, data, uh, it should allow us to leverage the strengths of the Unix platforms in processing text and building processing pipelines to efficiently handle raw caption data. And fourth, that it should be extensible, allowing us to not only work with materials from the 1980 system, known as 608, but also the original digital closed captioning system from 1971, TV time. The practical foundation of this approach is found in its two intermediate formats, a binary file called line 21 and a text file called tabla. The line 21 file is comprised entirely of a single video line, line 21, extracted from every source frame, while tabla file is the textual representation of the data extracted from those very same lines. In that sense, each row of data in these formats is a direct one-to-one -one ordinal relationship with the source video frames that they were derived from. FFmpeg is used to generate the line 21 files, which it does by converting each instance of line 21 into 720 8-bit raw luminance values. Since they're essentially raw image files, they can be readily visualized by your imaging program of choice. In fact, doing so is a recommended practice as it allows you to quickly spot issues with the source material and adjust your approach to data extraction. The tab raw file is a tab delimited text file. Each row contains seven columns of data, starting with the absolute frame number and the two bytes of extracted data. Now, in this scheme, the extracted data is, exp is expressed twice, first as hexadecimal numbers, then as decimal. This is for two reasons. Uh, first, to allow for the detection of data corruption, and second, to allow the user to choose whichever set of values best suit their application, platform, and scripting or programming language. In the tab raw format, all extracted values are decoded values. In plain English, that's just to say that unlike the SCC format, the end user doesn't have to perform parity checking of the data because that work has already been done by the data extractor. In fact, the results of that parity check, along with other extraction metadata, are stored in the reserved column. There, delimited by the dot symbol, are four fields of data, threshold, starting data position, parity bits, and extraction types. While the first two pieces of metadata which describe the data extractor solution open considerable possibilities. It's the parity bits that immediately allow us to improve upon existing caption data solutions. That's simply because knowing whether or not the data passed the parity check, which is what those ones represent, allows one to implement the error detection and correction functions of a hardware caption decoder and all that that, fun that capability brings with it. With these two intermediate formats, we began to develop a small ecosystem of tools to work with data in this way, comprising a three-stage workflow. The first stage begins with the data extractor, which takes a line 21 file as input and emits tab raw data as output. Other scripts and programs to which that data can be piped or fed a tab raw file as input were soon developed. These range from low level displays of transmitted data to fully exposing the content of complex caption streams. The second stage, editorial, deals with the non-destructive editing of tab raw files. A good example of this is the line recovery tool. It determines how many lines have parity failures in the user's best copy 
and searches any number of user supplied additional extraction passes for versions of those lines without parity failures. For each one that it finds, it adds a patch into a patch file. That patch file can then be used with the Unix patch utility to generate a new corrected tab raw file. In this way, the original extractions are retained untouched while the patched versions can be used in subsequent stages of the workflow. Delivery is the final stage. And for many 608-based captions, that deliverable is an SCC file. Other target formats are possible, either by way of writing a translator or using pre-existing software packages like CC Extractor. In typical usage, this workflow allows one to work independently of the original elements and realize gains in terms of both time and storage. For one 94 gigabyte five hour recording in our collection, the corresponding line 21 file is just 391 megabytes, creating a tab raw extraction, a transcript, and an SCC file takes only 121 seconds. Making one's collections accessible and searchable has rarely been easier. Now, whether or not the same workflow would be applicable to the 608 system's predecessor, TV time, was an open question. Only after a great deal of historical research and analysis of transmitted caption signals that we recovered did we discover that both systems transmit two seven-bit ASCII characters per frame on a single video line. This meant that we could use the same line 21 files and the same basic tab raw structure to encapsulate the original system. The only practical differences in terms of the tab raw files that we use for TV time are seen in terms of the reserve column. While we start with the usual threshold and starting data position fields, the remainder are populated with data extracted from the TV time signal, channel ID, YY bits, and stop bits. Since multiplexing in the system was performed by way of the channel ID, as opposed to dedicated control codes that were used in the 1980 system, the channel ID is the most crucial piece of data here. Without it, there's no way of knowing what is or isn't captured data. The three-stage workflow that we outlined earlier generally remains the same, with extraction and analysis still beginning with the data extractor, turning a line 21 file into a tab block file. However, as we began working with the TV time systems data, it became clear that there was a need for an additional tool at this stage. This tool is a, called a parser, which performs a simple yet vital function. It simulates how a TV time decoder would have interpreted the bit stream so that you can discern if there are syntax and grammatical errors. Syntax errors occur when malformed or missing control data fails to produce a valid, completely displayable caption. In this particular example, the loss of a single decoder command likely would have resulted in the third row of this caption not being displayed. With grammatical errors, Either the wrong characters are present or they're missing entirely. In this case, both a space and the letter W are missing from the caption because the clock burst is absent, rendering the transmitted data unrecognizable. While the causes of both syntax and grammatical errors can be manifold, they're usually the result of dropouts, loss of vertical lock, or interference, any of which can result in the partial or complete loss of the signal. As we moved into the editorial stage with these damaged signals, it became clear that we'd need another tool which would allow us to recover and repair damaged data. Building atop the concept's first explored line recovery, we created a proof of concept prototype tool called Repair Tool, which could perform three types of repairs. The first kind of repair is very similar to line recovery. It was only used once to compare decoding methods. Of greater utility, we're too closely tied editorial modes, markup correction and waveform explorer. Markup correction mode allows the user to overwrite the data in any line, even if there wasn't any data extracted on that line previously. Similarly, waveform explorer allows the user to visually inspect the waveform present on a line and manually set the threshold and starting data position parameters to generate a decoding solution that the data extractor couldn't or normally wouldn't be able to. 
In this way, you can recover data from lines that are missing portions of the signal or were partially received at an attenuated level. As with the earlier line recovery tool, completion of the work in each editorial session yields a patch file, which can be used to iteratively generate corrected tableau files. Those corrected files can then be checked in the parser for correctness, and the editorial process may be repeated as many times as needed. This makes the process, again, non-destructive by nature, since the original extractions are always retained. And this was exactly how we executed the corrections on both captioned programs that we recovered. We arrive at the delivery stage of the workflow with a fully validated tableau file coded in the PBS TV time system. However, since nothing reads captions from that system, an extra processing step is required here. That step is the final new tool required for this workflow, the 608 translator. It converts captions from the PBS TV time system to the 608 system, while maintaining the timing of the, each caption and as much of the original formatting as possible. Its output is a tabraw file coded in the 608 system, which can then be converted into an SEC file. In our case, we use these SEC files to author DVDs with which we generated the open captioned examples of the system. This, in a nutshell, is how we started with a system that had been developed to work with 608 captions and expanded it to support the first digital closed captioning system in North America. If you'd like to see examples of the translated captions in action and read about the system and how it worked, I highly recommend visiting our blog in which we documented the system for the very first time. Hopefully, with these and other developments, we can all begin to make the first 50 years of closed captioning far more accessible in the next 50. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis. And you know, we started a little bit early, so we do have um, some more time for you to take some questions. If anybody had questions, please put them in the chat for Dennis. We have a couple already um, from Carl that I will pose to you, Dennis. The first question is, uh, where does the TV time data come from and what kind of files contain these subtitles? TV time system was the, the original prototype uh, closed captioning system that was first demonstrated in 71 and 72 and started in 74. Um, these may be living on recordings in your collections in North America if they were recorded off of the PBS interconnect. Um, they have to be uh, captured and recovered like any other uh, signal or any other video signal. And once you have done that and identified the signal, you can do the transformations that we've talked about. And uh, there's a comment from Richard, um, also in response to that, speaking about um, his experience in the UK with that. Um, we have um, another question from Carl asking, if I saw correctly, the 608 subtitles were part of uh, MOV V210 files. Is that the same for TV time? Uh, well, like I, like I mentioned previously, these are predate that. Um, you can always, as part of your post workflow, uh, include uh, your closed captions in the, your, your MOV files uh, when you distribute it to uh, other persons. Um, but yeah, you have to go through the translation process to get there in the first place. Okay, and so we also have a request from Charles for you to pl please put your links from the slides into the chat, please, Dennis, and be at perhaps after your presentation that you can drop those in. People Absolutely. are curious to see those. Um, uh, Andrew has a question. Um, what are the chances of being able to extract this data from home recorded VHS tapes? Extremely high. Um, where we originally, where we got our copies of the signal were from Betamax tapes that had been sitting in a basement for 40 odd years. Um, so we spent some time last year where, where magically everyone had a lot of time on their hands and transferred about three to 400 tapes. And we found several examples of the system on there, but only two with uh, actual captions. So if you have anything dating from that time period from, well, realistically, anything up to the first or second quarter of 1979, it's possible to have that system or the tests of the 1980 system in the remainder of 1979. 
Great. And uh, Radoslav has commented that he will also be presenting um, next year's No Time to Wait with, with um, the technology he's working on this as well. Um, we have a couple more questions. I'm going to go to Dave's question first before going back to Carl's uh, third question. Um, Dave asks, um, beyond just reporting on their mismatch, how have you been using the parity data? Uh, you can use that um, to, if there are control codes, uh, you can use that to regenerate the uh, control codes that are in the, that, were, that were sent in the signal. Um, generally, how a, a, a caption decoder works is that it sends both of the, ca the caption control codes twice uh, as a redundancy. Uh, so if the parity is wrong on one of those characters, you can, and if the first character matches the second time around, then it'll assume that you, that that, that is the correct control code to use. And therefore you can do the same thing where you can just reconstruct the original control code that should be there um, and do that and, and use it in that way. Otherwise, yeah, there, there, there are other statistical things that you can do and figure out aspects of the signal, which are kind of beyond <laughs> what we were talking about today. And I would more than happy to discuss quite a bit. Um, and Carl says his final question would be, um, where can we find sample files with TV time data? Uh, I can make that available. That's, uh, I, that's a great question. I can make that available uh, to, for, for examination. Amazing. So if there aren't any more, oh, well, and one, more, one more question um, from Dave. Um, what would be your preferences in making this data accessible as a subtitle track? Um, can these systems be fairly replic replicated in something like VPP? Possibly. Um, that is definitely something look, to look into. Um, what the system did is that the, the big, the, the largest aspect of how the appearance difference, the appearance of these captions differ from 608 is that 608 puts a black background on all of the text. In the TV time system, only the characters that are on the screen have, have a black background. So you'll have a space that's a transparent space and you can simulate that, yeah, definitely do it using one of the subtitle formats, I imagine. Um, that wasn't what we were trying to do last year. But it, it is definitely something to, to look forward to. Great. And I agree with Kieran's comment that this is just fantastic. We need to upscale quite a bit in this area and actually work with the test files. Um, yeah, so the amazing presentation. Great questions from everyone. I have to admit it's a little bit over my head, but Sorry. I love learning all of this stuff. <laughs> um, are there any other further questions um, for Dennis? Um, we have a couple more minutes. Um, if not, um, Dennis, please put your links into the chat. I think many, a lot of people are interested in, in following up with some, uh, some of that information. Um, yeah, and, oh, I think we have another question or uh, maybe a comment. Uh, to Dennis, a historical note, um, because deaf people could not record TV programs on DHS with subtitles in the 1980s. The uh, RNID Deafness Charity made a special set-top box to send a video signal to the uh, VHS recorder that included burned in subtitles. Wow, fascinating. Good to know. Did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks to everybody for your amazing questions and comments. Um, and yeah, look for, look for Dennis in, in Gathertown to ask him more questions.